A 58-year-old male presents with frequent headaches, occasional dizziness, increased fatigue, occasional blurry vision, and increased thirst. He denies experiencing chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitations. Additionally, the patient mentions facing challenges in adhering to his prescribed medication regimen due to forgetfulness. His blood pressure is 150 by 90 mm mercury. Pulse rate is 80 beats per minute. Body mass index is 32 kg per meter square. Fasting blood glucose is 180. Hba1c levels are 8.5%. The lab investigations reveal total cholesterol, 220 mg per deciliter. LDL cholesterol, 150 mg per deciliter. HDL cholesterol, 40 mg per deciliter. Triglycerides, 180 mg per deciliter. Renal function tests reveal serum creatinine, 1.2 mg per deciliter. Blood urea nitrogen, 20 mg per deciliter. Estimated glomerular filtration rate is 65 ml per minute per 1.73 square meters. Electrocardiogram, ECG, shows no significant abnormalities. Medication history, his current medication regimen, metformin 1000 mg twice daily for diabetes management and amlodipine 5 mg once daily for hypertension control. He has been on this regimen for the past two years. Question number one, which subjective symptoms are reported by the patient? A. Increased thirst and blurred vision. B. Blood pressure. 150 by 90 millimeters of mercury c pulse rate 80 beats per minute d all of the above the right option is a that is increased thirst and blurred vision here subjective findings include include increased thirst and blurred vision while blood pressure and pulse rate are included in objective findings subjective findings are symptoms or information reported by the patient based on their own experiences and feelings Objective findings, on the other hand, are measurable and observable data obtained through clinical examination, laboratory tests, or diagnostic procedures. Question number 2. Which lipid profile result is abnormal in this case? A. Total cholesterol, 220 mg per deciliter. B. LDL cholesterol, 150 mg per deciliter. C. Triglycerides, 180 mg per deciliter. D all of the above. The right option is D that is all of the above. All the lipid profile results mentioned are considered abnormal and indicate dyslipidemia, which requires management to reduce the risk of cardiovascular complications. Total cholesterol, less than 200 mg per deciliter. LDL cholesterol, less than 100 mg per deciliter. HDL cholesterol, greater than 40 mg per deciliter for men and greater than 50 mg per deciliter for women. Triglycerides, less than 150 mg per deciliter. Question number 3. What is the patient's Hba1c level indicating? A. Excellent glycemic control. B. Moderate glycemic control. C. Poor glycemic control. D. Normal glycemic control. The right option is C that is poor glycemic control. Hba1c is a measure of the average blood glucose levels over the past 2 to 3 months. An Hba1c level of 8.5% suggests that the patient's blood glucose levels have been consistently elevated, indicating inadequate control of diabetes. Less than 5.7% means normal or non-diabetic. 5.7% to 6.4% indicates pre-diabetes. 6.5% and above indicates diabetes. Question number 4. Which medication class is the drug of choice for hypertension management in this case? A. Atenolol. B. Hydrochlorothiazide. C. Nifedipine. D. Enalapril. The right option is D that is enalapril. Enalapril belongs to the class of medications known as ACE inhibitors. In patients with hypertension and comorbid diabetes, ACE inhibitors are considered the preferred choice. Question number 5. What should be the most important recommendation to the patient in this case? A. Avoid using metformin and amlodipine due to drug interaction. B. Take metformin 2 hours before amlodipine. C. Take metformin on empty stomach. D. Take medication adherence seriously due to the risks associated with the missed doses. The right option is D that is taking medication adherence seriously due to the associated risks. 
Medication adherence is crucial for managing both hypertension and diabetes effectively. Missing doses of antihypertensive medications like amlodipine or antidiabetic medications like metformin can lead to uncontrolled blood pressure and blood glucose levels, increasing the risk of complications. Consistent and timely adherence to prescribed medications is vital to achieve and maintain target blood pressure and glycemic control. Now discuss the other options. Avoid using metformin and amlodipine due to drug interaction. This option is not applicable in this case as there is no significant drug interaction between metformin and amlodipine that would necessitate avoiding their use. Both medications are commonly used together to manage hypertension and diabetes safely. Take metformin 2 hours before amlodipine. This specific timing is not essential for taking metformin and amlodipine together. Metformin can typically be taken with or without food, and the dosing schedule should be followed as prescribed by the healthcare provider. Take metformin on an empty stomach. Metformin can be taken with or without food, as directed by the healthcare provider. There is no requirement to take it on an empty stomach unless specified by the healthcare provider. Question number 6. The patient's lipid profile reveals elevated LDL cholesterol levels. Considering the patient's comorbidities, which medication class would be most appropriate to target LDL cholesterol reduction? A. Azetimab. B. Alirocumab. C. Cholestyramine. D. Gemfibrosal. The right option is A that is azetimab. Azetimab is the cholesterol absorption inhibitor. Considering the patient's comorbidities of hypertension and diabetes, the most appropriate medication class to target LDL cholesterol reduction in this case scenario would be azetimab. Azetimab is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor that reduces the absorption of dietary cholesterol in the small intestine, leading to lower LDL cholesterol levels. It can be used as an adjunct to statins or as an alternative therapy in patients who are intolerant to statins or have contraindications. Alirocumab is a PCSK9 inhibitor, which is effective in lowering LDL cholesterol levels but is typically reserved for specific cases, such as patients with familial hypercholesterolemia or inadequate response to other therapies. Cholestyramine is a bile acid sequestrant, which can lower LDL cholesterol levels by binding to bile acids in the intestine. While it is effective, it is not the first-line choice in this patient with hypertension and diabetes. Gemfibrosal is a fibrate medication, primarily used to lower triglyceride levels. While it may have some modest effects on LDL cholesterol, it is not the first choice medication class for targeting LDL cholesterol reduction in this patient with comorbidities. Question number 7. The patient expresses concerns about potential side effects and the long-term safety of antihypertensive medications. Which class of antihypertensive medications can be recommended as having proven cardiovascular and renal benefits in patients with diabetes? A. Thiazide diuretics. B. Alpha-1 blockers. C. Calcium channel blockers. D. ACE inhibitors, ARBs. The right option is D that is ACE inhibitors and ARBs. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are the class of antihypertensive medications recommended as having proven cardiovascular and renal benefits in patients with diabetes. These medications are especially beneficial in patients with diabetes and hypertension because they provide protection to both the heart and the kidneys, reducing the risk of cardiovascular events and preserving renal function. ACE inhibitors and ARBs work by blocking the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which plays a critical role in regulating blood pressure. By inhibiting this system, these medications can help dilate blood vessels, lower blood pressure, and reduce the strain on the heart. Additionally, they protect the kidneys from the harmful effects of high blood pressure and diabetes-related kidney damage, making them an important choice for patients with diabetes and hypertension. Thiazide diuretics Calcium channel blockers, and alpha-1 blockers are also used to treat hypertension, but they do not offer the same cardiovascular and renal protective benefits as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, especially in patients with diabetes.